Recent reports have been flooding the internet that animals in Chernobyl appear to resist cancer. Chernobyl still boasts a much higher than average radiation level, yet nature seems able to flourish here. How is that possible? Today I want to take a look at what is happening in Chernobyl, specifically focusing on a species recently examined, the grey wolf, and talk about why in the face of increased radiation pressure, do these animals just not seem to be getting sick? On April 26, 1986, a malfunction during routine testing at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant triggered a series of explosions that coated the site and the surrounding area in a blanket of radioactive material, around 400 times more radiation than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The accident left a huge area of radiation-tainted land in its wake. The Chernobyl Exclusion Zone, established shortly after the 1986 nuclear disaster, remains one of the largest restricted areas in Europe, roughly equivalent in size to the US state of Rhode Island. Within this zone, radiation levels vary significantly, from relatively low levels that are considered safe for short visits to highly contaminated areas where the radiation risk poses serious health hazards. A sievert is a unit of measure used to quantify the health effect of exposure to ionizing radiation on the human body. It's a complex unit that takes into account not just the amount of radiation absorbed by tissues which is measured in greys, but also the biological impact of the type of radiation and the sensitivity of the tissues or organs exposed. Natural radiation levels vary around the world, but are typically around 0.15 to 0.3 micro sieverts per hour. But in Chernobyl, it can be significantly higher. The Luzerne swimming pool in Pirapat has radiation levels of 0.9 micro sievert per hour. Reactor 4, the site of the explosion, has surrounding roads with radiation levels between 2.4 and 2.6 micro sievert per hour. And the local cafe presents a notably higher level of 13.6. At hospital number 126, it shows radiation levels of just 0.7 microsievert per hour above ground, but ranges from 0.8 to over 328 microsievert per hour in the basement, indicating extremely high radiation in specific spots. The Chernobyl exclusion area as a result is a rare area capable of testing radiation effects on local mammals, particularly in the absence of human activity, and has allowed wildlife populations, including large carnivores and herbivores to thrive. The grey wolf in particular, which seems to thrive in abundance in Chernobyl, has recently caught the attention of researchers. Apex predators here are interesting to study because of the role that they play in their ecosystems. They typically have large ranges over which they search for prey, so offer generalized sampling of absorption of radiation doses, rather than just studying species that stay within a localized area like a hilltop pond or stream. As they are also at the top of the food chain, they can therefore be indicators of bioaccumulation and biomagnification of radioactive substances substances from eating radioactive deer and other animals in the area, and so help researchers better understand the flow of radioactive materials through the ecosystem. They also might one day teach us something about human medicine. Humans and wolves are much more similar in their genetic makeup, lifetime, metabolic rate, body size, and other physiological processes than species like mice, which are normally used for comparisons in medicine. The grey wolves in Chernobyl are interesting because they seem to be thriving even more so than in areas of natural protection around the world. They reach populations of seven times the density of other protected areas. It was this density, despite the radiation increase, that caught the attention of Dr. Kara Love, an evolutionary biologist and ecotoxicologist from Princeton University. Dr. Love's question was, well, just how much radiation are these wolves actually exposed to, and is it significantly above the normal? Before I answer that question, I wanted to mention that if protecting nature so that we can learn from it interests you, then stick around until the end of the video where I have a message from my friends at Planet Wild. They are working on creating a way that viewers can help other parts of the world achieve the biodiversity we've seen in the exclusion zone, but obviously with less radiation. To understand the ranges over which these wolves travelled, and the radiation doses that they were exposed to as a result, Dr. Love equipped wolves with radio collars to track their movements and decimeters to monitor radiation exposure in real time. Over the course of their study, the researchers found that the wolves received an average dose of 11.28 millirem per day, which is in the units that we were previously working in, about 4.7 microsievert per hour. This is the equivalent to 8 chest x-rays per day, or 1 CT 
scan or eating about 1.2 kilos of Brazil nuts. That's about 15 to 40 times higher though than the global average of 0.15 to 0.3 micro sievert per hour. And now that's a bit of a grey area there, no pun intended, but that's not a level that is so high that we'd be expecting all animals in the surrounding area to develop high rates of cancer. For context, most literature sites, exposure to 100 millisievert a year, or 11 microsievert per hour, is the lowest level at which any increase in cancer risk is clearly evident. The next question is whether or not the radiation was enough of a stressor to actually be a selective pressure to these wolves. Was the radiation from Chernobyl driving natural selection? Was it helping the wolves evolve in a way that would protect them from radiation in the future? And there's two possible routes here. There may be genetic variation within the population that could allow some individuals in the species to be more resilient in the face of that radiation. They would still maybe get cancer, but their bodies just have learned to deal with it better. Or they could be entirely resistant, that despite the radiation exposure, they just don't get cancer as much, because mechanisms have activated within their genome that prevent or treat it within their own bodies. Naturally, any individuals within the species better able to endure or resist altogether may live longer, procreate more, and ultimately shift the population as a whole in the direction of higher survivability in this low-dose radiation environment. Dr. Love's study focused on examining the genetic dispositions of these wolves towards cancer resistance. Starting with the immune system, Dr. Love took blood samples from the wolves to look for changes in their white blood cell counts. White blood cells come in five different flavors, each with special skill sets. Neurophils are on the front line chasing invaders, like what's captured in this charmingly retro 1950s video. Lymphocytes contain two types, B cells and T cells. B cells produce antibodies that recognize and neutralize specific pathogens, while T cells directly attack infected cells or cancer cells and regulate the immune response. From human medicine, we know that exposure to radiation shifts the ratios between the different white blood cell types as the body tries to adapt to the higher rate of damage that it's experiencing. When Dr. Love compared the ratios between the wolves in Chernobyl, a sampling taken in Belarus, and another sampling taken in Yellowstone, the results that she found showed that the white blood cell counts of wolves had changed in a similar way to humans undergoing radiotherapy. Both neutrophils and lymphocytes are reasonably radiation sensitive and are found to be reduced in patients receiving radiation therapy. This ultimately is a bad thing because it puts people at risk of infection but also weakens their ability to fight tumors, but it is one of the consequences of radiation therapy. The finding of this similar trend within the wolves shows that this radiation exposure is actually coming at a cost to the wolves in Chernobyl. Their defenses are being lowered. They aren't unaffected or ignoring the damage entirely. Supporting this idea, researchers found higher levels of two parasite species in the Chernobyl wolves than otherwise exist in the wild, maybe suggesting that the environment could be damaging the wolves' immune system and their ability to destroy these parasites. Early data from Dr. Love and her team suggests that despite low accounts of cancer-fighting white blood cells, they see changes in the wolf's genome that specifically deal with cancer response and anti-tumor response in mammals. So maybe we are seeing some evidence of genetic evolution caused by the pressure of radiation. What we're talking about are early pre-publication findings, so it's still up for debate which way the scientific community will fall on this. The 4.7 microsievert per hour is, being generous, half of the required 11 microsievert per hour to see clear evidence. But let's stress here, that's clear evidence of cancer. And this is still on the same order of magnitude, but we do need the scientific community ultimately to weigh in here. For comparison, it is estimated that astronauts could be exposed to 22 to 114 microsievert per hour, depending on the level of solar activity and the amount of time spent outside of protective habitats. Regardless though, we're in a really interesting regime of microdosing radiation and being able to study in a species whether it has an improvement to their ability to resist disease which we may learn from in the future, even if it does feel like we're slipping into Andrew Huberman territory. Like I said, the field hasn't yet weighed in on exactly this research. My PhD is in physics, but I'm not a cancer or radiation expert. Without irradiating a large area of nature though, to run a more complex test, I think this is still an interesting question to explore. But the research has also acknowledged that the flourishing of this wolf species could just be for a much simpler reason the absence of us. As we said at the beginning, the wolves in Chernobyl exist at seven times higher densities than even in the nature protection zones in neighboring Belarus, where humans tread much more willingly. Reasonably damning as an idea, but for these grey wolves at least, maybe humans are literally worse than cancer. 
Frustratingly, we may need to wait until after the Ukraine-Russia conflict subsides. This research, until further notice, has been paused. As well as their role in our ecosystems, we've seen that animals of our natural world often hold the key to understanding and defeating our own diseases. None of this is possible if animals become extinct, something that is occurring at an increasingly alarming rate. Because of this, I would like to take the time to recommend Planet Wild, a social enterprise and certified B Corp that funds ecosystem restoration. In their current effort, they're protecting the sun bear in the Malaysian jungle from extinction. Check out the link to their video in the description down below. They provide a way for you to directly make a difference for the planet it by financially backing their monthly nature protection efforts. And the best thing, you immediately get to see what your contribution has achieved, because they document their monthly missions in exciting YouTube videos. You can start with contributions for as little as $6 a month, that's less than two coffees, and if you don't want to support them financially at any point, you can cancel any time, no questions asked. The first 200 people will receive their first month's contribution to nature protection for free, so if you're interested, sign up below with the code BEN3. Thanks very much for watching, I'll see you next time. Goodbye.